From the early days of home computers until now, each period had its awesome games. But the ancient games had something modern ones don't, something that connected them to the real world, that made you proud to own them, that made them special, and that is definitively gone today. The Box. Not the insipid, soulless, plastic case that became the norm for all kinds of disc supports from DVD to Blu-ray, but the authentic cardboard box, with so many different sizes and shapes, so various imaginative design, so rich content inside, and that is now fully part of video games history. Big or small, bulgy or slim, game boxes could take any form. Their cover illustrations looked either minimalistic, realistic, humoristic, or dramatic, and their contents were extremely diverse too. Game packaging at its best, this is what this video is about. At the end of the 1970s, when consoles and home computers began to spread rapidly, there were three main types of support for software, cartridge, tape, or disc, and games were packaged accordingly. The 1980s saw the evolution of these supports. Games on cartridges came inside small size boxes without much in there except the game itself. ROM cartridges were pieces of hardware comparable to memory cards that allowed the game to load instantly. Games on cassettes came in even smaller boxes, typical magnetic audio tape cases. They were loading slowly and with a significant risk of error, meaning you had to patiently repeat the process all over. Games on diskettes were also using a magnetic support, but a more reliable one than tapes and disk drives and were also much quicker. There will be another video dedicated to software support comparison. This one is less technical since it focuses on the fun part, packaging. Let's review this important chapter in the golden age of computers. Game packaging depended on several factors, the support the game was written on, but also the manufacturer's commercial strategy. So let's structure our review along these two axes and compare the different types of support as well as the game publisher's strategies. The first two types, tapes and cartridges, had a rather basic packaging strategy that remained pretty much standard over the years. The third one, diskettes, was more flexible, in every sense of the word. It developed more freely and had more various aspects. Let's have a closer look on each one of these types. Cartridges. Contrary to a popular idea, these were not exclusive to consoles. Some computers used them too. In 1980, the argument was compelling. Cartridges were durable, loaded instantly, and didn't require any additional hardware. The Atari 400 and 800 included a cartridge slot in standard, and so did the early Commodore machines. But as disk drives became more affordable, the versatility of this type of support relegated computer cartridges to the cupboards of history. After 1984, game cartridges were the exception on computers, except for a notable one, the MSX. This one? deserves a closer look. The advent of the MSX standard was a significant event of the early 1980s. At this moment, all major electronic manufacturers were making their own MSX compatible. Despite this, the standard didn't really impose itself except in Japan, Brazil, USSR, Middle East, and a few European countries. But believe me, if you had an MSX, you knew the incredible quality of Konami games. From 1983 to 1989, Konami game cartridges ruled the MSX world. Most of them were great games and their packaging included some of the most emblematic covers of that time. Interestingly, Konami used a different name for its MSX releases than the ones most people are familiar with. For instance, Gradius was Nemesis and Castlevania was Vampire Killer. 
Other editors, such as HAL, released their own game series on MSX cartridges, some of which were very cool, but none of these publishers came close to Konami in terms of quantity and quality. For consoles, it was another story. Cartridges were the only type of support, but their packaging varied and two main types of game boxes emerged. Atari and Nintendo made the choice to use a traditional cardboard packaging system. The first generation of NES games stuck to this specific formula, a game sprite in action with diagonal game name and a series designation in the corner. The idea was what you see is what you get, and it wasn't a bad one. Cover pictures were usually misleading, as buyers often confounded it with actual gameplay despite the screenshots on the back of the box. Historically, box cover pictures had always been in excess of what the computer or console was technically capable of displaying. In my opinion, showing actual pixels on box covers was a great idea. It gave a cool style of their own to early NES games and made them immediately recognizable. But this original design quickly gave way to a more traditional one as artistic cover pictures began to appear. Top Gun is a good example of this evolution. Defender of the Crown is another. In the early 1990s, games for Super NES continued this tradition, with a slightly different box design and orientation, horizontal instead of vertical design, but still cardboard and homogenous in style. Whereas other publishers went on with cardboard strategy, Sega chose plastic. In my opinion, this was a poor choice. Game boxes look like cheap hard plastic cases for VHS tapes, unnecessarily large for their meager contents. And to make things worse, Sega never found a consistent style for cover pictures, which included a wide range of different styles, many of which were surprisingly ugly. Just look on Sega Master System how the ridiculous covers of Black Belt or Afterburner, for example, can compare to the more artistic ones of Galvelius, Altered Beast, Miracle Warriors, or Mickey Mouse. It's like Sega tried its own version of what you see is what you get when they featured minimalistic pictures as game covers. Unfortunately, this didn't always find its mark among players. On Genesis Mega Drive, the situation was a little more normalized. If covers were still different in style from one another, at least they were not trying to look distasteful like some of the Master System ones. Many were actual photos, especially when it came to sports, while others were great heroic fantasy paintings, like was the case with Golden Axe. And the black background looked way more serious than the white of the Master System. Typical home computer systems with magnetic tape drives include the early Commodore machines and C64, Apple II, TRS-80, Amstrad CPC-464, ZX Spectrum, MSX, and a few others. Although tape drives were also available for PCs, they don't seem to have been widely used on this system at any point in time. Packaging for cassette games greatly depended on the publisher. 
Most of them sold them just like plain audio tapes. In this case, the package was minimalistic. There was absolutely nothing apart from the tape and the case cover, on the inside of which were sometimes printed the playing instructions. This is sorcery for the MSX, a minimal package for a great game. I still remember anxiously waiting through its loading sequence. Would it crash or would the game begin? In more developed forms, the case could be slightly different, large enough to contain a mini booklet, like here with Solo Flight and Ghostbusters, emblematic games of the early period. Same thing with the many titles from Laura Ciel's published for the French-made Thompson systems. Some cases were even larger than that. Here we have 737 Flight Simulator, for example, with something that begins to resemble a serious instructions manual. Or the book-like Solid Cases by Infogrames, another French editor. Its mega-hit Mandragore was as big as to require two cassettes. But large or small, all were made of plastic. It seems like publishers considered that cassette tapes needed a sturdy package. That somewhat limited the different design possibilities. In addition, games on cassettes were not sold for a long period of time. It took five years or so for most systems to replace all their tape devices by disk drives. As a kid, I used cassettes for about three years only, from 1983 to 1986, and none of my friends used them beyond that time on any of their different computer systems. These factors explain the relative poverty of packaging variants for cassettes. Despite great artistic efforts on cover jackets, this type of game boxes was doomed to remain relatively unattractive and monotonous. The last among the three types of game support is the most interesting, because it developed into a universe without boundaries other than the fertile imagination of the publishers, the diskette box. This type of package was extremely varied on the outside as well as on the inside. It covered a time span comparable to that of console cartridges, about 20 years, which allowed for many tries in style. And contrary to consoles which tried to standardize their packaging format, with more or less success as we just discussed, there were at least as many different computer game packaging styles as there were game publishers. And that means very many, because each publisher also tried its own variations. This applied not only to the outward style, but also to what was inside the box. The increasing box sizes were sometimes artificial, just an effort to occupy more shelf space than their rivals and attract attention. But this was also fully justified in some cases. Many flight simulators came with extremely large, thick manuals. Other games contained elaborate copy protection systems, and see the related video on this channel. For over two decades in the 1980s and 1990s, you could find many cool things in those big computer game boxes aside from the game itself. Booklets or jumbo-sized manuals with almost encyclopedic data, comics and full-story books, gorgeous maps on paper or cloth, audio recordings, various game items such as metal runes, stones, figurines, pretty much anything. Just imagine, since that time, nothing like this was offered to modern players. Some publishers were not only known for the quality of their games, but also for the quality of their packaging contents. Microprose was known for its excellent manuals, F-19 Stealth Fighter, M-1 Tank Platoon, or Civilization came with something that looked more like books than instruction notices, complete with extensive data, extra maps, and keyboard overlays. With the absence of key mapping at that time, these proved very useful. Lucasfilm, Origin, and Sierra also earned their reputation of big box game publishers. When you bought one of those, you could be sure you were getting your money's worth. You could already feel it by sheer weight of package. These games were accomplished graphic pieces of work, which required many discs. In addition, there were often extra goodies inside. All that stuff made the box reassuringly heavy and full of promises even before you launched the game it contained. 
games on diskettes were usually more developed and complex than games on cassettes. This fact alone explains the change in box format. Those games required more data, thus more storage space. On the other hand, box size would have quickly become a limitation in the hypothetic scenario where diskettes had not existed and tapes had remained the only possible type of support. Could you imagine how many hours of loading time would have been necessary for a game like Wing Commander 2, supposing you read it from cassette tapes instead of discs? As a hint, a cassette tape could store a maximum of about 64 kilobits of data, against 1.44 megabytes for a high-density 3.5-inch diskette. And Wing Commander 2 had 7 of those, 10 megabytes in total. That's 10,000 kilobits. Divided by 64, that would mean over 150 cassettes. A very big box indeed. Editors like Cynosis made a point in providing superbly designed boxes for all games in their catalog. Just look at Barbarian, for example. But of course, not all big boxes were actually big. Many were less ambitious in size, but that didn't mean the game was mediocre. On the contrary, more than one small box actually contained a great game. Populous, SimCity, Dungeon Master, or Captain Blood are proofs that legendary titles don't always require a giant package. BigBoxCollection.com is an interesting site for big box fans. It's a project to put in VR 3D all your favorite game boxes. Even more, it seems like some publishers are actually considering releasing new products in traditional packages. Shall we see our beloved boxes reappear in stores? A topic to follow up. In your opinion, how does modern situation compare to the big boxes era? Around 2000, as all PC games migrated to CDs and jewel cases, and manuals came on the CD, as did the copy protection techniques, and then to DVD and Blu-ray, box size naturally decreased. And this time, games on PC were as much concerned as those on consoles. Uniformization took over. Slim cases took less space on store shelves and cost less than fancy cardboard boxes. Another 15 years later, as the need for support completely disappeared, so did the need for package. Today's computer games have gotten rid of any physical support. Only consoles still need it. But for how long? Not much, for sure. And yet, there are still many benefits to owning physical games today. The ability to share games with your friends is one of them, and after you completed it, you could trade it in for a new one in a dedicated store. One of the downsides to buying digital is the inability to return or trade a game once you buy it. Also, digital games are at risk of being lost for good if the provider decides to shut down operations. With physical games, you have control over what happens in the future. But to me, the most important benefit of physical copies is not a technical or commercial one. It's a more romantic one that allows you to connect with the game's world without necessarily playing it. It's the package it comes along with, the game box, its cover picture and the various contents you find inside. To someone used to owning big box games, full dematerialization leaves a strange feeling the game you bought is somewhat incomplete. Remember the good old days when you went to your local game store just to wander around, walking among wonderful boxes the cover of which excited your imagination. So appealing, so attractive. What's your opinion? Write it down in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe. See you soon. And in the meantime, have nice retro dreams.